joining us today. We're, we're super excited to have this conversation. Um, I figured Amy's conversation was amazing. I feel like you're all experts in recognizing how nervous we are right now in this very moment now. So, so no judgment, please. Um, we're up here to have a good time. But I think maybe it's worthwhile for everyone. Let's all stand up. And why don't we all go for a power pose here, hey? Let's, let's get powerful here together. OK, amazing. I feel better. Hopefully, you feel better. Wonderful. Now you make me sit back down. Yeah, now we have to sit back down. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so really quickly, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I'm a large enterprise account executive here at Staffbase. I've actually been with Staffbase for almost six years. It'll be six years in January. Um, I'm really excited to be here, not just because of the topic of discussion, but one of the favorite things, or one of my favorite things about my role at Staffbase is that I work with communicators like you and, and the three of you every single day. Um, and it's amazing to connect and establish what I would describe as real relationships. Um, so that's why I'm here and I'm excited. So maybe, Susan, if you want to introduce yourself and we can start Sure. Down. Hi, everybody, and thanks to Staffbase for having me and Allison, Sam here. Um, I'm the Director of Communications and Public Relations for South Shore Health, which is a health system of about 70, I'm sorry, 7,000 people uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I direct internal and external communications. We took on internal about a year and a half ago. I have a background in broadcast um, journalism and public relations leading up to healthcare. So, thank you. Yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Allison Gillis. I'm the Senior Internal Communications Specialist at South Shore Health. Um, hopefully my body language is giving fun, flirty, relaxed, <laughs> just the type of person you want in a crisis, right? <laughs> now what's my body language say? I know. Um, Hi, I'm Samantha Hillstrom. I am the Senior Director of Employee Experience at Blue Apron, and I am responsible for internal comms, employee engagement, and workplace experience. I got my start as a TV producer at CNN, so I've been through a bit of a crisis at uh, any given time, depending on the news. Um, and in addition to my role in internal communications, I am actually a certified crisis counselor through Crisis Text Line and a certified birth doula. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so let's, let's begin. So let's dive in. Uh, Samantha, maybe starting with you. Okay. What are some of the biggest communication challenges that you faced over the last year, and which methods maybe have worked and which ones haven't? Um, so we were joking backstage about how tired we are to hear about in these uncertain times, because like, when, was, when have things been certain and when will they be? Um, but I would say that for our work staff, so Blue Apron is um, a 2,000 person company and about 1,600-ish of those employees are non-desk workers um, who pack the Blue Apron boxes. Staff base is a lot of Canadians, so for those who don't know what Blue Apron is it's a um, meal kit service and um, so I would say over the last year in particular we're kind of coming out of the COVID haze um, and you know we went through a small layoff at the end of 2022 um, I should say small because it was in comparison to what we're seeing lately and what um, so many companies are facing and then just on the internal communication side um, I think burnout right like p there's just so much burnout we we um, as internal communicators, we're often teams of one, two if you're lucky, three if you hit the jackpot. Um, and so we are always trying to do so many jobs as one person. And so I would say like on my personal end, that's where we are. But as a company, I would say we're coming out of what does life look like post COVID. More recently, we returned to the office. So there was stuff around that. Um, but those are the things that we're facing. One of the other things I should make mention of is that when we think about crises, it's not just what's happening inside as a company, um, but what we're dealing with externally, you know, and over the last year we've seen a lot of, um, well, in 2020, you know, social justice issues, um, more recently things like abortion and shoot, uh, gun control and whatnot, and how do we respond to that as a company as well. So it's not just what's happening inside, but also what are we responsible for communicating about what's happening outside. Totally. Um, Susan, Allison, anything from you on what uh, are some of the challenges that you're facing right now? What's working? What's not? Yeah. Well, we um, have had a similar year, you know, coming out of COVID. We also had a major surge within the past year of COVID, RSV, and the flu. 
um, staffing challenges are enormous for us as they are across many industries where we are tasked with uh, keeping um, employees, retaining employees and recruiting at the same time. So no sooner do we bring people on board, but um, people are leaving and we're just, you know, we're never sort of getting ahead. So that's been um, an important thing for us in terms of supporting HR and recruitment. Retaining employees is very important as well. Um, we also, being in the industry that we're in, have had some crisis moments. Um, it, within the community, and we are very much a community-based organization, um, where we had a major incident where a car went into an Apple store and injured, severely injured a large number of people, um, and uh, one person uh, died in the incident as well. So um, that was an unexpected crisis, um, and it's not uh, unfamiliar to us as a healthcare organization. So uh, dealing with those moments and um, and helping employees through that as well is very important to us too. Yeah, that's a real moment. Um, Allison, what kind of strategies are you deploying or, or leveraging in those situations? Yeah, so I think working in healthcare, we have a very like unique perspective, and I don't mean to sound flippant when I say this, but crises are kind of like our bread and butter. We drill for mass, mass casualty events, we drill for code pink, child abduction, mass shooter events. Um, I'm trying to think, but code brown, and I'll let you guys think about what that might entail. Um, it's a utilities or facilities failure where um, a, a water line got disrupted and we couldn't flush the toilets in the hospital for about three days. So when you think of crises, I mean, our people practice and they drill for it and they're so prepared. And so I kind of, you know, coming into it, there's an existing structure, there's game plan. It's kind of like when those things happen, our people spring into action, they're prepared to deal with it. And that makes my job a little easier as an internal communicator because there's a playbook, they know what they're doing. I get to just come in and make sure the information's pushed out, people feel informed, we wrap it up, we tie it up in a nice bow. What's more insidious is like what you're talking about, Sam, is just the, and Susan, the burnout. Um, people are fatigued, they're tired their, you know, their mental health has taken a beating just from living through COVID as a person and then working in healthcare during COVID, the mental health crises that they're experiencing themselves and then we're seeing it in our ED. Um, so that kind of stuff is a little bit new to us and we've really had to be very thoughtful and intentional and proactive and advocate to, you know, leaders are aware of it, but the importance that they hold over our employees for, they're looking to you to say something about this, to acknowledge it, to recognize it. It doesn't have to be all sunshine and rainbows to call it what it is and be forthright and transparent. So I'd say transparency yeah. is a huge tenet of how we approach crisis moments in our organization. Yeah, yeah I mean, building trust, it sounds like kind of similar to um, what Amy was discussing earlier. So for you, Samantha, like what kind of advice would you give in terms of balancing like effective communication during a crisis, um, but then also leveraging potentially the plan that you already have in place? So crisis communications, I don't think is all that complicated when you think about it compared to the work that we do every single day. Um, most of us in this room are writers and some of us are journalists by trade um, and so I feel like you know some of the easiest stuff is when in a crisis kind of simplifying everything go back to the the five W's that we learned <laughs> in school you know who what where when and why um, but I think that the most important thing that I take with me in crisis comms or any comms for that matter is um, specifically around uh, transparency, as, as you were just saying, and um, communicating often. So when there is silence, that is when rumors start, that is when anxiety starts. And so our, our employees are looking to hear from us as much as possible with as much detail as possible. And along those same lines, um, if you know me or have met me, you know that I am a no BS person, and I take that same approach in communications. Employees do not want to be messaged to, and I think that that is the absolute first way to lose trust. Um, when, when you try to treat your employees like they are shareholders, or, I mean, some might be with equity, but you know what I mean, um, like the shareholders, or the media, or um, even a vendor, you know, all of those types of things, like treat your employees like people, 
Um, and I think that that pays for itself, right? Like, and we've seen more over the last three years in particular where um, internal comms is external comms. You know, with social media, our employees are often, employees of companies are often the first place to break news, you know, to, to people on different social media platforms, whether or not, you know, you've seen how many um, viral videos of bad layoffs happening on TikTok, you know, um, or bad uh, ways people handle things on Twitter, you know. Um, and, and so we have to make sure that we are not only treating our employees like human beings, but also equipping them with information so that they don't create information themselves. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I think I'm a big proponent of authentic communication. Yeah. And I think that um, does a long, it goes a long way in terms of building that trust. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, Susan, for you, uh, how, how do you work to build trust, specifically maybe with your leaders as they're communicating back into the business? Yeah. And I realize this is a challenging thing for a lot of organization is to be close to your leaders because in large groups, you know, sometimes you don't have access to your senior vice presidents, your CEO, et cetera. Um, so finding a way to get as close as you can to senior level leadership is very important because you want to understand what their um, strategies are, what their vision is, um, what their goals are what is the state of affairs at the organization at the time? And we try to get our senior leaders not only to be transparent with us as communicators, but with uh, the colleagues in our organization. Um, so we meet once a month with senior leaderships to talk, leadership um, uh, folks and talk about what our strategy is going to be each month going forward for internal communications. What are some of the messages that we want to talk to people about? Um, and build more structure as well. We have senior leadership meetings once a month as well, and that involves about 250 mid-level to senior leaders. Where we talk about finances, we have the CFO uh, give an overview of what's going on with finances. The chief strategy officer talks about what our strategic plans are. We're building partnerships out right now with other health care organizations. So it's very important in that way to be transparent and to bring people into the fold um, to, to see where the organization is going. Um, so that's very helpful to us because uh, with each one of those meetings, Allison and I can go back and say, all right, we've got this plethora of information now. How do we break it down and make it relative to the colleagues who are anywhere from transporting patients um, to uh, running you know, our medical centers? Um, so that you know, those, those relationships, as close as you can get them, are very important to try and uh, nurture. I think it's also important to, along the same lines of what you're talking about, you know, um, we as internal comms people are the PR people for our executives. And a lot of, I'm sure people in this room have faced situations where um, sometimes leaders are afraid to talk um, or they're afraid to say anything with fear of saying the wrong thing. And that's a big no-no, especially these days. And so it's incumbent upon us to encourage them to communicate and communicate as often as possible even in more formal ways like you're describing with these um, these large meetings that you hold, but also getting out there on the floor, so to speak, if there are opportunities to interact with employees that way, some of those more informal um, relationships and conversations as well. Because I think that when everything feels very like, this is now a message from our CEO, it can feel mm -hmm. very, um, uh, scripted and inauthentic to what we were talking about. And so it's our, it's our responsibility as I see people to be PR people of our, of our executives for that reason. Um, and I've noticed, this has not been the case at Blue Apron, thankfully, but I've noticed from some of my other internal comms colleagues how they're fighting an uphill battle to, to get their, um, their leadership to talk about important topics especially ones like that we faced over the last couple of years, like a lot of the social justice issues. Yeah, I mean, I'm, one of the things that I think about um, listening to both of those responses is, um, you know, as internal communicators, you have a really direct pulse on your audience, right? Like they trust you and you know them. So when morale is low, maybe after a crisis, how do you handle that? What kind of strategies do you leverage to, I guess, recognize that and then build up from there? 
So open-ended, anyone who feels like they have something yeah. you want to say there? Yeah, well, just kind of addressing that and also going back to what we were just speaking about, I hold myself to the same standard that I hold the leaders. Like, if I'm saying get out there, talk to people, I better be doing that too, especially we're a health system of multiple sites. And there is that feeling a little bit of, you know, you always talk about the hospital. Why aren't you talking about what we're doing over here in the wound center or, you know, over at South Shore Medical Center? And so I'm really cognizant and aware of that. And so I, you know, if I want people to authentically tell me how they're doing what they want to hear and what they expect from our leaders, then I need to meet them where they are. And sometimes that's physically going and making it easy for them to talk to me. And it could be, you know, building off, like, it takes time and investment, at least for me. It's been like a, since I've been in this role, like starting off small, like having interactions with people, and they could be small, but they remember me and they know, okay, Allison, she puts together the daily newsletter. Oh, there's something that would be helpful to put in there. I'm going to go reach out to her. And I feel like slowly building those relationships is coming to fruition, especially in moments of crisis when people need to act quickly and they want to know something quickly. They know, okay, this is someone I can reach out to. There's a process in place. People are handling this behind the scenes. And when the crisis is over, I know this, the topic of this panel is the first 24, but I think it's really important to carry the narrative through and not just you know, be like, okay, this is what you need to do in this moment of crisis, but at the end of the day, give people an opportunity to like debrief and wrap it up and say, this is what went well. This is what we, we did really well. We should be really proud. This is the impact we had. This is how we rose to the occasion for our community and this is what we learned so going forward we're going to change our processes in this way and then people feel like you've closed the loop and they can kind of have closure and move on. Totally. I think that's yeah. a great point like when you think about the, the phrase of meeting people where they're at and where, how that physically, that sometimes that means physically meeting them where you're at, you know, not to dog anyone in our profession, but sometimes it can be really easy as internal comms um, professionals to sit behind a computer and pump out stories or pump out emails instead of getting um, on the floor. And when you're thinking about, to the point that you just made about um, being in a crisis and have, if they know who you are, they know who to go to. At the same time, if we know who they are, we know how to talk to them. And if that, you know, for, for Blue Apron, um, we have, uh, like I said, uh, the majority of our employees are the ones packing the boxes. And you better believe that I have packed many a Blue Apron box. And uh, one time was the ice person. It was my job to put the ice into the box. And the conversations that happen by being in those um, situations have made me a better communicator in uh, my everyday communications and then also when things get really serious and we need to to reach people quickly yeah you know your audience better obviously mm -hmm. one of the things I think was interesting there is this idea of in a crisis there's actually a need for two-way conversation or two-way communication mm -hmm. and we need to actually um, not only communicate to our audience but give them the opportunity to share feedback back so yeah. maybe uh, Susan anything that you're doing in, in your strategy for that yeah, I think um, Allison touched on an interesting point, and that is debriefing after a crisis as well and bringing people literally into a room to talk about what happened and how we can improve to educate ourselves on the lessons learned during a crisis and to hear people's um, frustrations of how we work through things or mistakes we may have made, um, things like that. So that's a very important um, uh, approach that we take in our, in our uh, incident command structure that we always follow up. We do an immediate what we call a hot wash with people who were most impacted among colleagues and then we'll do a broader debrief as well. Um, I think it's sometimes too like the oxygen mask analogy. Like, you know, when we think about we're taking, you were just describing how um, you bring people together to debrief, and sometimes uh, who's taking care of us? Who's debriefing us? You know, yeah. um, when I've done uh, too many layoffs in my career, and they're the most difficult thing, um, in my opinion, to to do from a from a communication perspective. And so many times after something like that, you know, it's where. I got to put the oxygen mask on myself um, and turn to, to my colleagues to support me through that. You know, in, in our roles, we're really selfless. Um, that's an inherent trait, I think, that is crucial to the job. But also, we are human beings as well, and we, we have our own feelings and emotions about that, um, about a crisis, whether it be like what you guys are describing, a, you know, a major medical crisis or something mm -hmm. like a layoff or just a hard day. But um, is finding your best friend at work or ways to, to recharge? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'd love to understand how do you take care of yourselves 
um, when you're working so hard to take care of the entire organization? How do you manage that? We've built um, a colleague wellness program, um, and it's very visible. It's on our portal. Uh, we run workshops on a regular basis. Uh, we have a, um, a doctor who's our, our chief of that program. Um, he's a psychiatrist. And uh, we're, we're just constantly creating those conversations with people in terms of the resources that are available. If you're burnt out, if you're frustrated, if you need to talk to someone, we do have the resources available for you. And we have clinical people in our setting who are on a daily basis dealing with tragedy. Mm. You know, people who are very sick with deaths, with crisis, with, you know, the ED, uh, it's just, it's endless. Um, so those resources need to be there. Personally, um, you know, we, we are always busy as everybody is, but um, we, uh, you know, I, taking a step back and allowing yourself to take a break is so important because, and I know this sounds pat, but um, you're no good to anyone else unless you can take that, you know, t step back and take care of yourself and be refreshed and, uh, and, and go back to work with a new mindset. Yeah. I would uh, agree with that and you know we had a couple really tragic events happen in our community and we're a community-based health system so a lot of people live and work in the same area that we're serving so when these really tragic events happen our colleagues feel it deeply myself included um, and so you know while we drill for a lot of like really things that normally people would be like well, that's terrifying but it's not as a doesn't affect people as much as you think it would because we're prepared for it. It's that kind of emotional component mm -hmm. um, that has been, that's been new to me is really kind of letting myself feel the feelings and what do I do with those feelings and how, you know, realizing that our colleagues are expecting us and our leaders because they trust them to create a space for them to feel their feelings. And so when, after one particularly terrible um, incident that happened in January, we r quickly realized that it wasn't enough to have this, you know, very heartfelt, well-written um, message from our president and CEO. Our colleagues wanted more and they expected more and they, they felt like we should provide that for them and not know, oh, you should be doing this kind of way. It's that they wanted to ha expect us to put together a space where they could come together and share in their grief and their outrage and their, and their sadness. And so we did like have a healing service and that was the first time we had done that and it happened kind of quickly and it was like who is running this? Is it colleague well-being? Is it marketing communications, internal comms? Is it senior leaders? Is it the medical? So that for me was, you know, I hope we don't have to do that frequently, but for me, I'm like, that was a really, you know, transformative moment for me to think about, like, how can we rise to the occasion? What did we do well? What didn't we do so well so we can better serve our colleagues totally. going forward? My, I would also say, don't be afraid to ask for help as well, even if it's outside of your organization. During that same incident, um, and, and I'll be frank, it involved, um, uh, children who died suddenly at their mother, allegedly at their mother's hands. And it was in a very small town. Um, and the fire chief of the town and I are, are friends. Um, and he was dealing with his own internal issues um, because his um, emergency people had seen just devastating things. Mm -hmm. He reached out to me and said, I need to write something I need to write uh, you know, something to address the media. I'm gonna be at a news conference. I don't have the capacity to do this right now. I am racked. I'm taking care of my people. Can you please help me? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's like that. I mean, I can imagine if I was in that spot, I would, you know, I may be in a position to seek help. So never hesitate to do that. We all are part of a larger community. So we don't have all the answers and sometimes you just need to lean on other people as well. I yeah. think that's beautiful. Um, I mean, the themes I'm hearing are we want to have trust, we want to build trust um, and be open and authentic. We want to provide two-way conversation both from you and, and back to you, but also we want to create space for um, our employees that also communicate with each other um, and share the, the shared experience that they're going through. Yeah, and we don't <coughs> have to just, I'm sorry yeah. to interject, it just we don't have to tow the company. That's not the time to be like, and this aligns with our strategy in this way. Like, we just need to create the space to let people have those organic conversations and just feel their feelings. And 
there was gratitude for that. And for me, to be able to do something as small, seemingly small as that and be part of that is very gratifying. And it's a privilege and it's humbling to bear witness to the people that are out there literally every day saving lives. And I'm sorry if I sound hyperbolic about that working in healthcare, but it really is a matter of life and death and be able to be invited into those spaces and be able to tell the stories of colleagues who are doing extraordinary things every day is a real privilege for me. And so I feel like, you know, I really want to do it right. I, when something like that happens, I want to do everything I can to support our colleagues who do so much to support our community every day. Amazing, amazing. Um, Samantha, what, what do you see in the future? What is the thing that's on the horizon in the next 12 to 24 months? Um, and, and what are you doing about it right now to get ready? I thought you were going to ask me how I'd cope with stress, and I was like, TikTok. It's only TikTok. I just numb out with TikTok. Um, it's That's just, the other talk later. Today. Yeah, it's just me and a glass of wine and some TikTok for an hour, minimum. Um, uh, um, what do I see on the horizon? Um, well, I think we're going to see um, continued uh, employee activists, um, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, I think that obviously, you know, sometimes they can be mouthy and that's, tr that's tough, but I think that our employees, um, you know, at Blue Apron and at other companies I've seen and we've seen across the board are holding people accountable and holding leadership accountable because of the voice that they hold, not only within the organization, but um, externally as well, like I said before. Um, I hope that we see more, less messaging, more transparency um, around stuff. I think that it's been interesting to listen to uh, one of my friends as her company's going through a layoff as we speak. Um, and it's been interesting to hear how she, her company is navigating that. And so it's, um, I think that what we're going to continue to see is hopefully people innovating on what it means to be empathetic. Um, and and really le leaning into that. Um, I think that there's not an appetite anymore for anything less than that. Um, and and I think that that, like I said, that drives accountability across the board. Any any thoughts from you, Susan, on on that subject? We have two big initiatives coming up um, this year. One is surrounding strategy, and we're growing as a health system. We started out as a hospital 100 years ago, and we're really um, in a period of growth um, in a very competitive uh, market in Boston. As you, Boston has a reputation for being a, a medical mecca. Um, so as we grow our partnerships with some of those um, Boston area uh, health systems, um, helping employees to understand why it's important that we partner with people that we have largely been competitive with and sort of uh, helping them to, to not fear it but to in, in embrace it um, as, as something that is important to our community. Um, so that is, um, that's an important um, strategic initiative. And then we have another one around reliability and safety, which will be an, an, um, an organization-wide uh, campaign um, uh, to instill a little more reliability on the part of colleagues, uh, clinical or otherwise, um, and safety, which is, is very important to us for regulatory reasons and for all of you who are patients. <laughs> um, so um, it, Building the uh, communications around that is, is going to be important, and um, I'm, I'm not trying to suck up or anything, but I think that um, you know this that being with staff base will allow us to have the tools to do that, and Allison and I will be the arbiters of uh, you know trying to get the, the company to come on come on board with that. Amazing, yeah. yeah. Appreciate that. So maybe enough questions for me. Uh, we have a couple of people with microphones. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Questions from the audience? I think we have two over here. So let's get the microphone over here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ray Rivera, and I lead um, internal communications for J Crew. So I guess I'm, you know, one of the questions I have for you all is. Um, you know, given all the things that are happening in our society, whether it is rights being taken away or um, gun violence, how do you choose what to respond to? And 
I know a lot of us are kind of struggling with the same issue, but is it like a type of framework or any tips or resources that you might be able to share with us to kind of help us better guide the communication? Oh, I love that topic um, because over the last three years, the things that I have written as an internal communicator that I'm most proud of are the things that are around the issues like you're talking about. So the response that we had to George Floyd and um, the response we had to the Black Lives Matter movement and abortion, uh, Roe v. Wade and, and whatnot, um, they're the absolute most difficult things, apart from layoffs, um, but also to me the most impactful things. Um, I think it's a great question and something we all face because there's no there's no um, template for it. Like you know, this many shootings a year we can respond to, and this many um, rights being taken away is what our quota is. You know, and that's sad. It's funny, but it's like sad that that's how we have to think about them. Um, I don't have a better answer than going with my gut. Um, on it and and see and also looking to see what other people are doing to be honest um, I think that if we respond it's so sad but if we responded to every school shooting it would be a weekly thing right um, if we responded to every mass you know major um, change in government that would be um, a weekly, almost daily thing. Um, I think you have to also take a look at who your employee population is and what affects them the most. Um, so, you know, we have um, a huge female population, female identifying population at Blue Apron. And so when the Roe v. Wade situation happened, um, how, how do you, I mean, frankly, you could argue that it affects everybody, but all that aside, you know, I looked at, we had to look at our population and say, you know, what, what is going to impact them the most? Um, we have a large population of people of color in our fulfillment centers in particular. And so when the issues around um, George Floyd and BLM were going on in the summer of 2020, um, it was a no-brainer on whether or not we were going to address that. Now, we have gotten... Um, it, it's dicey, right? Because there are we've gotten feedback like, why didn't you talk about this thing? Why didn't you talk about that thing? Are you going to talk about this thing? And um, and there's it's not a perfect science, um, but I think the best way the best way to gauge what you should and shouldn't talk on to speak on is by using your employee population as the barometer um, and what and what impacts them the most. Um, I think that. At Blue Apron in particular, so we um, were one of the first companies to give election day off and um, we hosted voter registration drives um, with an internal program called Red, White and Blue Apron. And, um, and so we, we've done that for the last couple of years and it was, and, um, you know, it was a really interesting project for me, a highly political person in particular, to make sure that it was a nonpartisan um, event, that every employee could feel safe registering to vote for whoever they wanted to vote for. Um, and so I think that sometimes um, leaders are so afraid of polarizing employees that they end up saying nothing. Um, so in addition to that, if you can't figure that out, then I think you lead with your values. So I guess I said that there wasn't an answer, but maybe there is, um, which is which is looking at your population and leading with your values. I think. I would say be very careful. I mean, when you when you go down that road of uh, taking a point of view on a societal societal issue, you need to be prepared um, for feedback, both negative mm -hmm. and positive. Um, it just I would say pick and choose carefully. Um, so there are hot button issues um, that you could isolate some of your colleagues with. Um, some are more obvious than others that you need to take a stand, but I would say to weigh those things very carefully, especially in the age of social media where your colleagues and your community um, may be upset. So um, wade through those waters carefully. And I, I think it's, it's different than having a point of view in terms of a brand or a philosophy. Um, is, and I think there's a lot of pressure on organizations right now to take a stand. Um, so caution. And it's interesting. I would say yes, 
and don't let the fear of employee sentiment stop you from saying something. Because if your goal is to appeal to everybody, you will lose. You, that will not happen. So that's why you have to root it in who, what your values are as a company. And if you can back that up, then it doesn't really matter if it upsets someone or not. And so I think that's what we have seen is sometimes a fear of that um, actually end up silencing companies and that end, ends up hurting them in the long run. So it's a, it's a dance, right, of being careful but not being so afraid of your employees that you end up saying nothing. Um, because if you can back it up, then, um, you know, if it's a values-based decision, then it doesn't really matter what someone thinks. Awesome, great question. I think we have time for one more. Um, I know that there's a lot more questions in this crowd, right over here. Um, I'm right behind the pillar, so to say. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kristen Kazrazadi. Um, I support PPG Industries and do internal communications for a lot of our manufacturing facilities. Um, this question's, I think, probably mostly for Susan and Allison. Um, most of our crises are around safety issues, so things that you know are uh, I and I's on site, employees getting injured, things being spilled. Um, do you have a strategy around responding to safety crises in a way that helps build safety culture rather than just kind of being harsh on those incidents that are going to occur? Yeah I, yeah, I mean, I would say that, so we have a whole dedicated, you know, quality and safety team, and that is their focus, and we're here to support that, and we have to be aware of what they're doing so that our messaging is in alignment and supports them um, accordingly. But the approach that they take that we have followed is that, you know, it's about the processes. How can we look at our processes and design them so that p there's not that error that's built into it and not blame the person, but look at the safety event and say, what went wrong? It was a breakdown in our process. And how can we design our processes so it's not pointing fingers at people and creating that sentiment so that when mistakes happen, people feel comfortable coming forward because they know the focus isn't going to be, well, what did you do wrong? It's going to be, where was the breakdown in our processes and how can we make it better? So it's kind of interesting. I feel like internal communications and communications is so much like you want to apply, you want to appeal to like the person and create a narrative and personalize and make the a leaders approachable. But at the same time, you want to talk about processes and not make it all about the people and that they don't, don't feel comfortable saying, you know, when something happens, they don't want to be singled out or picked on. So how do we talk about how are our processes in place that support the success of all of us within the organization? And I'll let you. I think that's true externally as well um, to, um, to be in a position where you um, address the safety honestly, or the breakdown in safety as honestly as you can. There will, you know, you'll have a legal team on you that you can say this and you, can, you can't say that or whatever. Um, but to be as honest as possible to say, you know, um, we had a, you know, a potential breakdown in our processes and um, you know, there will be uh, a thorough investigation, but right up front within the first 24 hours. You know, be honest, get that holding statement out there. You know, we're looking into this, we'll have more to say um, once, you know, more information is released, et cetera. Um, take control of the message as quickly as possible. If you do have a crisis, you want to be the first to get that message out there. And as Sam said, be consistent about following up with those messages so that, um, you know, you're, you're leading the information. Yeah, and celebrating success too when things go right. I mean, so often like the non-event is the victory, but it's like hard to celebrate. So I know that we have our chief nursing officer who is, uh, he's now creating his own weekly nursing newsletter using staff base, which we're very excited about. Um, and he includes that kind of, say, like we've had this many days since our last like central line infection, which isn't very <laughs> exciting probably for most of you, but for them, that's, that, that's exciting and that's a victory for them. It shows that their hard work and their dedication and why we do these things and have these checklists yeah. and these drills and these trainings, it's coming to fruition because it's leading to good clinical outcomes and safer experiences for our patients. I mean, yeah. I just want to say um, thank you so much to the three of you. <laughs> Incredible. I think we could talk about this all night long. Yeah. Um, but thank you everyone for attending. And